for all of us, uh, this begins God's Holy Day uh, process, and we're at the beginning of it. We've had the Passover, and now we're moving on to the Days of Unleavened Bread. And uh, it begins a special time that will go through all the Holy Days and rehearse, rehearse for us the plan of God. And uh, what a blessing it is for us to be involved in that plan and the, and the work that God is accomplishing in our lives. And uh, we can be uh, most thankful for God's grace and God's mercy in allowing us to, to be a part of all that. As I begin my uh, sermon today, let's go to Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23. And when you look at holy days, this is always a good place to start because it... Uh, summarizes everything. As you look in Leviticus chapter 23, it uh, says in beginning in verse 2, it says, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them the feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to, the, to be holy convocations. These are my feast. They aren't Israel's feast. They aren't Jewish feast. They aren't Christian feast. They are God's feast. And we as God's people observe them. It tells us to keep the Passover, and it says, tells us to do that on the 14th day of the, of the first month at twilight, and the Lord's is the Lord's Passover. And then in uh, chapter 23, verse 6, it says, and, up, and on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. To the Lord, seven days you must eat unleavened bread. On the first holy day, you shall have a holy convocation. And then it tells us that we are to have a holy convocation on the seventh day, which will be this upcoming Friday. Now, as I was, I, I was reading through and looking at, at uh, the book of Deuteronomy, I came across a, a phrase that was repeated in that particular book. And uh, that phrase uh, was something that I used in order to put together my sermon. So I'd like to be, begin by asking you, how many of you have lived in Egypt? I don't think anybody's lived in Egypt. I think I know that a number of people have visited Egypt, but I don't think anybody's lived there. Living, uh, how many of you have been a slave? How many of you have had the experience of being a slave? Living in Egypt or being a slave are experiences that we would surely remember. They would be vivid experiences in our minds. And God has chronicled the slavery of ancient Israel and the nation being freed from Egypt. And he has done that because he wants us to learn certain le lessons through that experience. And it portrays certain things that are crucial to our lives as God's people. So the, the phrase that I came across that uh, I felt would be helpful here on the first day of unleavened bread is found in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 15. So I'll just read it to you. And in that verse it begins, You shall remember you were a slave in, Egypt, in the land of Egypt. You shall remember you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Now that was written to the people of Israel but it's also written to you and me because God wants us to remember that we were slaves as well. We not, may not have been slaves in the land of Egypt. We can look at it as slaves in the land of Bab Babylon. We can look at it in different waves, ways, but we were slaves. So how do we relate to the instruction to remember that we were slaves in the land of Egypt when most of us have never been there and most of us have never physically been slaves. In the sermon today, on this first day of unleavened bread, let's consider what we are to remember about our enslavement in the land of Egypt. As you think about this subject and remembering, where did the remembering begin? Where did it begin? As the people of Israel were toiling with rigor under the hand of the taskmasters, did they remember anything at that point. All they were doing was groaning. They were suffering as slaves in the land of Egypt. That's all they knew. We're suffering. We would like to have relief from this, this, but they had no way to resolve the problem. So somebody else began the process. Somebody else remembered 
what, where they had come from and the pro a promise that had been made. And let's look at that, this in Exodus chapter 2, verses, verses 23 through 25. Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. So things have changed for the people of Israel with the death of, of Joseph and time passing. A new Pharaoh's come uh, to the throne and he does not look favorably upon the people of Israel. So he determined that they would be slaves and he would put them to work and make them so work so hard, the goal was to destroy them, to wipe them out. And since they didn't seem to be wiped out by all of the work they had to do, what he did, he said, well, we can't wipe them out that way, so what we'll do is we'll, we'll kill the male children. And the people had to work hard and they cried out, and God heard them. It says in chapter 2, verse 23, Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob, and God looked down upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. So God had entered into covenant with Abraham back in Genesis chapter 15. And he had promised them that they would go into a land and they would be oppressed, they would be sojourners. But at the end of 400 years, he was going to free them. And God remembered that he had made that promise. And God was going to intervene to save them. So how does Israel's hard bondage translate to our time? How does that translate to our lives Let's go to Romans chapter 3, or let's just go to Romans chapter 6. I'll just quote chapter 3, verse 23. We're told there that we have all sinned and we have all fallen short of the glory of God. And there is no harder bondage than sin. There is no harder bondage than sin. And the whole world finds itself in bondage to Satan in bondage to a system that is his system, and they're all sinners. And if you are a sinner, you are enslaved. I mean, Christ pointed out that very thing in John chapter 8 where he, they said, we've been, never been slaves to anyone. And he said, you guys are missing it. You're slaves to Satan, and you serve your father, Satan the devil. And just told them straight out, exactly where they were at, which didn't make him any more popular with them. But let's go to Romans chapter 6, verse 16. Romans chapter 6, verse 16. In verse 16, it says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey? So if you sin... And you continue in that path. You do it habitually. Sometimes it's a slip up. It doesn't matter. If you give in to sin through temptation or through oversight, whatever it may be, you are the slave of sin. And like Paul goes on to say here as he finishes the verse, whether of sin leading to death. And that is the outcome of sin. It only leads in one direction, and that is to death, or of obedience leading to righteousness. Two paths, one leading to death, one leading to righteousness. As we think about remembering this covenant, does this apply only to the physical descendants of Israel? Let's go back to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. So in Galatians, Paul is talking to a group of people who were Christians who had lost their way. They had been forgiven of our, their sins through faith in Jesus Christ, and now they're going back in to the world by adopting circumcision and seek to be saved by the works of the law. And Paul tells them in Galatians, you can't be justified by the works of the law. That's the point of Galatians, justification. It's not earning salvation. 
But Paul makes an important point that applies here when we think about uh, our salvation and how God is working with us. Let's go to uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 15. It says, Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant, yet it is confirmed to uh, no, confirmed. no one annuls or adds to it. So once you have the covenant, you don't annul it or add to it. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. So they, they had the promise of being able to come out of the land of Egypt and be taken to the promised land. But there was more to the promise than just the physical outcome, as, as Paul brings out here. He does not say, he says, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. That's the seed that was going to bring salvation and benefit to every human being. That was God's plan, to open up the way to salvation for every human being through the seed, Jesus Christ. Verse 17, and this I say that the law which was 430 years later cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before, before by God in Christ that it should make the promise of no effect. So a promise of salvation was given. So when God set up the old covenant, did it annul the promise that God had made, had, that God made about salvation? It did not. It did not. For if the inheritance is of the law, which it is not, the inheritance was by promise. It is by faith. It is no longer of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So the promise is to Abraham and his seed, the coming of Christ, and that's going to apply to all people. Let's go on to look at verses 26 through 29. It says, for you are all the sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. You're all the sons of God. Not because you're related to Abraham, but you're all sons of God because of the faith in Jesus Christ. We believe Christ is our Savior. It is through him that we can be forgiven of our sins. And we can be justified and we can be reconciled to God. It says in verse 27, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. So God, through his spirit, has bound us together in order to make us one. God through Jesus Christ and the Spirit dwells in each one of us. And it binds us together. It binds us together. And we all have the hope of salvation. The, verse 29 says, And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. You are his spiritual descendant. Abraham was the father of the faithful. And in faith, we become his descendants and heirs according to the promise. Not heirs of a physical land, but heirs of a spiritual kingdom that God wants all man to be a part of. So <clears throat> we see here that God is the one who remembered the covenant. And he heard Israel groaning, and he brought them out. And you don't think that God hears people groaning today under sin? He's heard people seen all of the sins of the world and God has heard the groaning and God has set a certain number of them free to become a part of his family and his goal is to set all free. So what we've experienced will be the experience of all people. So how did God free Israel from slavery? What method did he use? Let's go to Exodus chapter 3 and look at, let's look, begin in verse 7. Exodus chapter 3 and let's begin in verse 7. There it says, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. So God is talking to Moses here, talking to him out of the burning bush. So he, he's saying that um, he's, he's seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. 
He knows life is hard for the people of Israel. And he says in verse 8, So I have come down to deliver them out of the, the, the hand of the Egyptians. God is the one who's going to deliver them. They weren't going to deliver themselves, and Moses wasn't going to deliver them. He was the leader, the instrument that God used, but God was going to deliver them. And he says, uh, to, to, uh, he says, and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, and all of the other ites that are, that are mentioned there. Verse 9, now therefore behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, and that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So Moses was going to be God's representative to go before Pharaoh and to be the instrument by which he delivered his message to Pharaoh to let the people go. And <clears throat> Moses played a very crucial role in that whole process. He says, Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And, and Moses played a very formidable role in what was taking place there. But Moses was only a type. He was only a type of a savior and a, a, first, a emancipator to come. And, and as you look in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, it said there that the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear. And he was pointing that there would be a prophet greater than he was that was to come. And in the book of Acts, we see that prophet that came mentioned. Acts chapter 3, verse 22. <clears throat> Acts chapter 3, verse 22. So you see this Old Testament type in Moses. But Moses was only a type that was pointing to something that was greater. Acts chapter 3, verse 22. And it shall be that every soul who will... Well, let's begin in verse 22, like I said. For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. So this prophet was going to be more important, more significant than Moses. And it was important that people would listen to him and follow his direction. Verse 24, yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. God allowed the prophets to foresee the coming of the Christ and to give different, different details of the coming of the Christ. I mean, David and other prophets elaborated on the fact that Christ was going to come. Isaiah, Jeremiah, they all foresaw what was to come. And then in 31 AD, Christ died on the cross for you and for me so that we could be reconciled to God. He came as God foretold. <clears throat> and it says in, in, in verse 25, You are the sons of the prophets and the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, In your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Everybody will be blessed. Not just the people of Israel, not just the Jews, but all people. Because God's goal, as we know from the book of Hebrews, is to bring many sons to glory. Not a few sons, many sons to glory. In verse 26, to you first, God having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from your iniquities. To allow you to be forgiven to allow you to be reconciled to God and have a right relationship with him, to work in you to establish the righteous requirements of the law in your life. So God sent Moses, and Moses was a type. Christ was what that type was, was pointing to. Now let's think about the night to be observed. We, many of us observed, we got together last night, we enjoyed the meal and, the, and it was not just to get together and have a big meal. The purpose was us for, for us to think about what it represented. What took place on that night 
back in 1443 B.C. They began walking out of Egypt on that night. Exactly the same time that, that Abraham had entered into covenant with God in Genesis 15. And exactly as God said, it worked out. And on that night, they came out of the land of Egypt. And it was a, a most significant event. And that's why we get together. Let me just elaborate it on it a little bit more here. Let's go to Exodus chapter 12, verse 40. What's described in Exodus 12, beginning in verse 40, is not just a, an opportunity for us to get together and eat and drink and fellowship. There's something much more significant that it's reminding us of. In chapter 12, verse 40, it says, Now the sojourn of the children of Israel who lived in Egypt was 430 years. So they were in Egypt. They were in a sojourn 430 years, part of that in Egypt, and part of it in enslavement. Verse 41, And it came to pass at the end of 430 years, on that very same day, the same day that God entered into covenant with Moses, that very same day. It came to pass that all the armies of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It is a night of solemn observance to the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord, a solemn observance for all the children of Israel throughout their generations. Now, some of us in this room are descended from the children of Israel, Israel, and a portion of us are not. And it doesn't matter whether, at this stage, whether you are a descendant or not. You are a spiritual descendant. And just as God brought Israel out, he brought you and me out. And this is symbolic of God intervening to free us from bondage. The Kyle and DeLitch commentary on the Old Testament says of this passage, This night is a preservation night of the Lord to bring them out of the land of Egypt. The same night is consecrated to the Lord as a preservation for all children of, of Israel in their families. God intervened to save them. And it was last night that God intervened to lead them out. The commentator Adam Clark adds this. It says, it is a night to be held in everlasting remembrance. Israel was to keep the night to be observed, much observed as a night of watching, of watchful vigil to commemorate the reason they were able to leave Egypt so easily. The reason they could flee from Egypt unscathed was due to God watching over them as his plan unfolded. Their sojourn in Egypt as a slave people disciplined them and prepared them for the trek to the land of promise. And what's unfolding there and begins on the first day of unleavened bread on that evening was God's plan. So God watched over them to bring it to its completion. And it couldn't have been accomplished any other way. God watched over them. God made it possible for that to take place. However, as we recognize, that plan is not complete. It's not complete. That plan has eternal consequences, and it is an ongoing operation. So we celebrate this that day, that most significant day. Because has God called everybody out of the world he's going to call? He has not. There are more that will be free through God's might and God's power. So as we think about this, can we deny that God was watching over Israel? Can we deny that God was watching out for them? Think about it. On Passover night, was God watching over them? He instructed them that on the 14th of Nisan, between the two evenings as the evening began, they were to sacrifice the lamb. All of them were to sacrifice the lamb. And they were to take some of the blood from that lamb and they were to put it on their lintels and on their door doorpost. And all the people of Israel did that. And then God passed through the land and what, did he, what happened to the, the, the Egyptians? All the firstborn of Egypt died, both of man and beast. 
Not only did it impact most households in the land of Egypt, it even impacted Pharaoh. Now, the Pharaoh didn't die because he wasn't a firstborn, but his firstborn child died. All firstborn died. Th think about it. How many of you are, are firstborns? Quite a few of you. And you know what? If we were in Egypt and we didn't put that blood on the, the doorposts and the lintels, we wouldn't be standing erect. So the Egyptians, they didn't do that. They didn't know of it. Or if they did know of it, they didn't do anything with it, and they died. So how closely was God watching over the people of Israel? And you know, not only that, that God passed over them and, and spared them, but he also made it possible for them the next day to pick up and leave and meet at a place called Ramses. That was the congregation point. And you know what? If you were going to wipe out Israel, why not do it right then? Why wait till they leave and then let's charge after them with our chariots and overtake them and kill them all or make them come back? Why not say, hey, guys, this isn't going to work out. You're staying here. Something was taking place that prevented that from happening. As you look at uh, it, it talks about how closely was God watching we, can, we understand that watching does not mean that he's just looking on and he's doing nothing. He's actively involved. And it suggests that he was actively guarding them. The word uh, that's used there for watched is the Hebrew word shamar. And it's used in many places in the Old Testament. In fact, it's translated 283 times and indicates preserve or secure. And uh, it also su it suggests not just watching but keeping guarding, protecting, and preserving. Let's go to Exodus chapter 11 and look at verse 7. Exodus chapter 11, verse 7. And as we look at the first part of verse 7, it tells us the extent to which God was watching over them. Verse 7, But against none of the children of Israel shall a dog move its tongue, against man or beast. So think, think about that. If you have a dog and somebody walks up to your house or somebody walks in front of your house, what does your dog do? If it's like my dog, I know my dog barks. He barks. And uh, if you've been to my house, you know he barks. So when you come up to my house, he's barking, he's at the door, and he sounds pretty savage, doesn't he? And uh, so, but... Uh, he's really a pussycat, but he sounds pretty tough. And dogs, if, you know, in my, at my house, if somebody walks in front of the house or somebody comes up the driveway or the UPS guy comes, he barks. And that's what dogs do. So you would expect as Israel began to walk out of the land of Egypt, you've got three million people, between two and three million people. So do you think that as they're marching out of there, they're going to make some noise? They've got cattle, they've got burrows, they've got uh, all sorts of paraphernalia. You don't think there's going to be some clanging and banging as they're moving out of the land? And he says, not even a dog is going to bark at you. And that's not normal for dogs. So how did that happen? It was God's intervention. It was God's intervention, and there were no dogs barking. Yet God was watching so closely that not even a dog barked as they left Israel or left Egypt. And look at what it says in the latter part of verse 7. And why did God do this? He did it because that you may know that the Lord does make a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. Israel was the nation God was calling out. And he wanted them to recognize there was a difference between them and the Egyptians that God had directly intervened to save the people of Israel. And he wanted them to recognize that he was watching over them. So he watched over them to make sure that they could safely congregate at Ramses. He was watching over them to protect them and to make sure that the dogs didn't even bark at them. And God was very carefully watching over them because think about this, the Egyptians have just lost 
all their firstborn. So they've got dead all over the land. They've got dead animals they've got to deal with. So you don't think they were a little bit unhappy with the people of Israel. And like I said, the ideal time to attack Israel and to bring Israel back into enslavement was right when this was unfolding. But they never did that. And that, that's not normal. People tend to take revenge pretty quickly if something like this had happened. So the Egyptians, I'm sure, blamed Israel for everything that t- take, was taking place. They couldn't attack Israel's God, but they could attack Israel. But they did not. As you th- One thing that I forgot to mention there, think about the fact that Israel spoiled the Egyptians. They had worked for years and received no recompense for that. So God, how, how was it that they went and talked to the Egyptians and the Egyptians gave them all of this wealth? You know, if somebody comes up to your house and said, hey, uh, can you give me most of your gold and silver? You're going to close the door and probably call 911. But they gave of their riches to the people of Israel, and Israel walked out rich. They walked out rich. So uh, as the children of Israel struck out into the wilderness, let's go to look at chapter 13 of Exodus, verses 21 through 22. Exodus chapter 13, verses 21 and 22. There it says, The Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. And so as they're leaving Egypt, God is leading them out in a pillar of fire. So he's showing them the way and leading them where he wants them to go. In Exodus 14, we find that Israel, God, where does God lead the people of Israel? Is God watching over them? Does he care for them? Well, God leads them out to a place where they're entrapped. They've got the Red Sea before them. They've got mountains on either side, and you've got Pharaoh and his army behind them. And God knew that Pharaoh was behind them. So what did God do? God got between. He went from out in front of Israel, went behind them, and he made a separation between Egypt and Israel. He protected them, and he ensured that the Egyptians couldn't see. It was dark. But on the other side, there was light. God was watching out for them. God was caring for them. And God, at that time, opened the way for them through the Red Sea so that this vast number of people could walk over uh, through the bed of the Red Sea in a very short period of time. Was God watching over them? He most assuredly was. So the night to be observed is the official recognition of God's watchful care. A whole nation of slaves, without having to lift a hand to affect their liberty, walked away from their captors. Most people that go through something like this, they have to rise up in rebellion. They have to overcome their captors, and they have to fight their way to freedom. And many people who go through that process, they lose their wealth. Israel didn't lose their wealth. They walked out wealthy. So... God intervened for them and watched over them and protected them. And through this feast, God is telling us spiritually that Satan's whole system, spiritual Egypt or Babylon, is supported and sustained by man's slavery to him. And this world is enslaved to Satan, the devil. They don't know it. Most people wouldn't admit it, but they are because they're caught up in sin. So, Someday, everybody will have their chance to be free, their chance to be a part of God's very family. So as you think about the night to be observed, it's a most significant night where God watched over Israel and brought them out, began the journey toward the land of promise. And God brought us out, and God watches over us as well. Let's now go to Exodus chapter 13. And begin in verse 3. So we keep unleavened bread as a memorial. It's something we are to remember. 
ex uh, the days of unleavened bread are days that we are to remember. Exodus 13, beginning in verse 3. It says, Remember this day in which you went out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand the Lord brought you out of this place. So we are to remember that we were in bondage in Egypt, in this society, this civilization, however you want to view it, just as Israel was in bondage in Egypt. And God brought them out, and he brought us out as well. And in memory of that, it says, no leavened bread shall be eaten. So to help us remember, he said, during this time, I want you to eat that which is unleavened. On this day you are going out in the month of Abib, and it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, which he swore to your fathers to give you a land flowing with milk and honey, that you shall keep this service in this month. In the first month, with unleavened bread beginning on the 15th day of the month. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days. And no leavened bread shall be seen among you, nor shall leaven be seen among you in all your quarters. We're not to have any leavening in our homes. And we are to do without leavening, and we're to be conscious of it. And, you know, old habits die hard, and, uh, you know, we, you know we, we go out to lunch, and what do we order most, most weeks? A ah, hamburger. So you're there about three bites into it, and we remember, or... It's Donut Tuesday. They always have donuts on Tuesday, and I usually get one of these and one of those, and so you've got one of these and one of those, and you're munching away on them, and the next thing you know, uh-oh, I wasn't supposed to eat that. And it's interesting how it works to where we, it dawns on us, hey, it's the days of unleavened bread, and we've all had our experiences, and we all have our stories. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and no leavened bread shall be seen among you, nor shall leaven be seen among you in all your quarters. I know when I first came upon the days of unleavened bread, I saw the word, I knew how it was spelled, but I didn't know how to pronounce it. How did you pronounce that when you first came upon it? Was it unleavened bread? That's how I pronounced it. I mean, you know, hey. I didn't know any better. Then somebody said unleavened. Okay, I know how to pronounce it now. So uh, something you had to, had to learn. And no leavened bread shall be seen among you, nor shall leaven be seen among you in all your quarters. And you shall tell your son in that day, saying, This is done because of what the Lord did for me when I came up from Egypt. So this is a legacy that God has given to us, a memorial that we're to remember as parents, and then we're to pass that along to our children. Why do we do this? Why do we eat unleavened bread? Why are we doing this, Dad, Mom? And you're to tell them. You're to tell them why we eat this bread that's different from the other weeks of the year. <clears throat> he says, it shall be a sign to you on your hand. And as a memorial between your eyes, that the Lord's law may be in your mouth, for, it, for with a strong hand the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this ordinance in its season from year to year. Yes, God freed Israel with a strong hand. Well, what about for you and me? Is there anything like that that took place in our lives? Let's go to Ephesians and look at chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Let's begin in verse 18, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. It tells us, at beginning in verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. He's speaking to God's people, to the church, to Christians. Your eyes being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. God has opened your mind to see his calling, his purpose, what he's working out in your life and other people who are a part of the church and ultimately will work out in all lives of all those who will turn to God. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Are you rich? Are you rich in the truest sense? Recognizing the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Verse 19, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe 
according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the the heavenly places. Who did God do that for? He did that for you, and he did it for me. Christ died for our sins, and Christ was in the grave three days and three nights, and he was resurrected. Not for God's sake, for your, your sake and my sake. He was raised up, and he sits at God's right hand, and he's anxious to return and establish his kingdom here on this earth and to prepare the way for the new heavens and the new earth. So God did all of this for you and for me. And it's something that we we need to remember. Verse 20, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. For above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also that which is to come. So God intervened and God freed Israel from Egypt through his might and his power. And he, he, he basically he the, the showed that the gods of Egypt had no power, none. Who is the Almighty? Who is the ruler of the universe? All of those gods that, that the Egyptians worked, that they worshipped, they had no power against God. And he showed Israel his greatness and his power. And he showed Pharaoh, you are a God, but you have no power either. None. None whatsoever. So when it's talking about principality, power, and might, and dominion, and every name that is named, it's talking about Satan and the demons. They rule this world. And he said, they have no power against me. They can't keep you captive if I want you to be free. They can't keep, they can't restrain what I'm working out. He says in verse 22, And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, that is Christ, which is his body. The fullness of him fills all and and in all. Chapter 2, verse 1. And you, those who he called out, made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins who were in bondage. He freed you and gave you life in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. That's the spirit that works in the world around us. And God said, I'm bringing you out of that. And I'm giving you an, a new life and a, something much great, of greater value than anything you left behind among whom also we once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. We have been saved. God intervened to save us and to open the way to salvation. So we are, to, that's, we are to remember that God intervened through his might and power to save us. And let's go to look at the, the Sabbath. We remember my phrase here, and the purpose is to talk about uh, remembering you were slaves in Egypt. As you look at Exodus chapter 20, God freed Israel f- from slavery in Egypt, and, and he revealed his Sabbath to them. And they were to, as he reveals the Sabbath in Exodus, he tells them they're to remember their creator. But as you look at what he he does as he gives the second giving of the law in Deuteronomy chapter 20, what what happens there? Or Deuteronomy chapter 5, sorry about that. Deuteronomy chapter 5, what does he tell us? He tells us something a little bit different. We are to remember our creator. But he tells us beginning in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 12. He says, Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, 
nor any of your cattle, nor, you, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. It says in verse 15, And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Remember that. When you were in Egypt, did you get a break? Did you get a Sabbath rest? No, they worked you every day from dawn till dusk, possibly. We don't know exactly, but they served with rigor. They had no time off, no breaks. It was just hard work. And so you went out tired and you came home tired. It was a hard, hard life for them. And he says, remember you were a slave in Egypt. And remember that then as you think of other people, you think of your animals. He said, you know, you need to let them rest and your servants rest. They need a rest too, just as you need a rest. So he says, remember that. And he says, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. That's why we meet on the Sabbath. So the Sabbath not only reminds us that God is our creator, but it also reminds us that he is the one who redeemed us, the one who delivered us from spiritual Egypt, from the dominion of Satan and society and our own sinful natures. And this, so the Sabbath day represents rest. It represents freedom. And every Sabbath, the Israelites were to remember they had been slaves, and we are to do so as well. Now, most of the time, I don't think of that. I do remember my creator. But I don't think about, you know, I'm to remember that I was a slave in Egypt. So that, that stood out to me this year, and hopefully it will stand out to you. And so, so there's an, I, another additional tie-in with this is that as you look at the burial of Jesus Christ, it was on that Wednesday during the week when he was crucified. He was buried before sunset on that Wednesday. And when did he rise up? He rose up on the Sabbath day. Our Savior rose up on the Sabbath day, toward the end of the day. Three days and three nights from the time he was buried, he rose at the end of the Sabbath. In that death and resurrection, we are freed, as Paul says in Romans chapter 6. We are freed from slavery. And that's what a point that Paul makes in the book of Romans. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 17. It says, But God be thanked that through, though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. God brought you out, and God opened the way for you to begin to live his way of life, to begin to obey that form of doctrine to which you were de delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I, and I, Paul says, I speak in human terms because of weakness, the, of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness, and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. So God has brought us out, not to continue as being slaves to sin, but to leave that behind and to begin to be slaves of righteousness and to become the holy people that are prepared for God's kingdom. So we are, as we keep the Sabbath, to remember that we were slaves in Egypt. Another thing that relates to this is Israel is to have the right perspective, a perspective that ancient Israel was supposed to, to receive from being slaves in Egypt. It was that God was a protector of the weak and of the outcast. And God makes this point in Deuteronomy chapter 24. Deuteronomy chapter 24. Now, you, you look at Israel when they were in Egypt, they were a slave people. They had no rights. They had nobody to represent them. They had nobody to protect them. So injustice was easy. There was nobody to stand in the way. But God loves and cares for the downtrodden, 
And so he tells Israel certain things about the way they're to conduct themselves. He says in 20, chapter 24, verse 17, he says, You shall not pervert justice, do you the stranger or the fatherless, nor take a widow's garment as a pledge. But you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you to do this thing. You are not to oppress or take advantage of or cheat or pervert justice for the downtrodden. Anybody, for that matter. You are to treat them all with equity and justice and thoughtfulness and care. You are to remember that you were a slave in Egypt. Let's go on down to verse 19. This relates to the same principle uh, that, they're to, that they're to remember when, that they were slaves in Egypt. Verse 19, when you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the works of your hand. When you beat your olive trees, you shall not go over the bows again, boughs again. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. You can, you can go through and pick up everything. Pick it clean. Nothing's left. And he said, don't do that. Go through. Make that first picking. But don't be too meticulous. Leave some for the poor, the oppressed, the downtrodden. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not glean it afterward. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command you to do this thing. You know, when you were in Egypt, you probably would have liked some of those gleanings. You would have liked some of those grapes, some of those olives, and the other things that came from the field. But you didn't have all of that. And nobody left anything for you. You got what your taskmasters provided. And it wasn't the best food possible. They didn't have that. And they said, when you come into the land and I pour out my blessings on you, you've got to remember that you were a slave in Egypt and that should guide your thinking in the way that you treat other people. Treat them honestly. Treat them fairly. Think of them as you go about your business. So it's a, a, a different mindset. Now, as you think about that, does that have anything to do with the New Testament? You say, that's not New Testament at all. That's Deuteronomy. But think about what it says in Matthew chapter 25. Let's go to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. Think about this. Does this relate to what he's telling the people of Israel? Matthew chapter 25, and uh, let's begin in verse 31. Here it says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, when he will sit on the throne of his glory, all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them, one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the, the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of the father of my father, inherit the kingdom uh, prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. For I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was a, in prison and you came to me. Does this relate? I think it does. It is a New Testament ap application of what he's saying. He's saying you need to remember you did without, that you suffered as a slave in Egypt and that should guide your thinking. So instead of living selfishly without a care in the world for other people, you need to be thoughtful. You need to care for them. You need to do justice for them. Now, can we fix the world? Not at this point. But when we have opportunity, this should be our guide. Because God's going to judge us on this. So when somebody needed a drink, did you give them one? When somebody needed help, did you help them? It's not where you're looking for them, but you know, as life unfolds, uh, people sometimes just come our way, 
and we have the opportunity to help them. As you think about, let's look at uh, let's look at one one more passage here that I think is helpful. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 15 and look at verse 15. I quoted that verse as I began the sermon. Deuteronomy 15, verse 15. There it says, You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. There I command you this thing today. So what were the people of Israel to remember? Let's look in Deuteronomy 15, beginning in verse 12. I know panic's starting to set in. Man, he's almost gone two hours. But we'll make it under the wire. Deuteronomy chapter 15. Let's pick it up in verse 12. Deuteronomy 15, verse 12. It says in verse 12, If your brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, is sold to you and serves you six years, then in the seventh year you shall let him go free from you. And when you send him away free from you, you shall not let him go away empty-handed. You're not to use his services and then when his time's up, say, adios, good luck. No, you're to give him a helping hand to get a start. You're to give him a helping hand to get a, get a, get a start. Not to send him, send him away empty-handed. You shall supply him liberally from your flock and your threshing floor and from your wine press, from what the Lord has blessed you with. You shall give to him. You shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt. And the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this day. So you are, you were, you became a freed from slavery through God's redemptive process. You were redeemed. You were a slave and you had no power, no ability to free yourself. And you didn't deserve anyone intervening on your behalf to save you, to redeem you, to pay the price of what you owed in order that you could be free. But I sent my son into this world to die for sin. I sent my son into this world to pay the price because if you sinned, the wages of that sin is death. And you have no ability to pay that. No ability. There's no amount of law keeping and being good that's going to pay that price. But I looked down and I saw the condition you were in, and I sent my son to be the redeemer. And he redeemed you and me from the penalty of sin. We owed that debt. He paid that debt for us, and he allowed us to be free. We have all been slaves to sin. We have all committed sin, and we don't deserve God's mercy. Let's see what he tells us here. In Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. A couple of verses to go and we'll be done. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. It says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. The law in and of itself isn't a curse. It's holy, just, and good. It is spiritual. It comes from God. And it is a guide to how to live. But the curse of the law is that if you break it, you are going to die. The penalty for breaking the law is death. And that price has to be paid. But Christ redeemed us from that curse. Having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. He became, he became the curse. Anyone hanging on the tree was considered cursed. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. He redeemed us. He made it possible for us to be forgiven, to be reconciled to God, and to begin to live the way of life that God wants us to live in preparation for being in his family forever. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Verses 18 and 19. It says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, 
like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. We weren't redeemed with gold or silver or anything of this creation. It says, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Christ, the Lamb of God, it is through him that we have been redeemed. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. So God intervened to allow us to be forgiven as, as a lamb without blemish. Christ is our redeemer, and we are to remember that. So brethren, the unleavened bread bread story began with God remembering his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We being their spiritual descendants, God remembers us, and God cares for us and watches over us, and he called us out in memory of that covenant. And as God sent Moses to be an instrument to lead Israel, Jesus was the ultimate fulfillment of the leader of the people of God. And it is Jesus who leads us out of slavery and leads us toward eternal life. As God watched over Israel as they began their journey out of Israel, of Egypt, so God watches over those whom he has called out. He was very careful in, his, in watching out for Israel. You don't think he cares for us? You don't think he watches us as meticulously? Oh, I think he does. What he offered them was physical blessings. He offers us eternal life. The chance to be a part of his very family. You don't think that's important to him? Absolutely. So there are probably less dogs that bark at us as a result of that as he cares for us and watches over us. We keep this day as a memorial, a reminder that it was God who brought Israel out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And like Israel, we have no power to break free of the the enslavement of Satan, the world, and our own human nature. We can't break free on our own. It is through God's mighty hand. It is God who brought us out of bondage, and we are to remember that. We are to remember that we were slaves in Egypt, which is one of the focal points of the Sabbath. So each Sabbath, think about the fact I was a slave in Egypt, and I'm to remember where I started from. And we were oppressed in this system, and remember where we came from helps us to think of how we treat others. God said, you were a slave. How'd you like that? Do you think other people like it? So it's important how you treat others. So as we think about the week ahead, we are in the days of unleavened bread and remember God's admonition throughout this week. Remember, you were a slave in Egypt.